Welcome to today's City Council meeting. Our meetings are public and you're welcome to join us in person or by watching from the Council's agenda page, Zoom, Facebook, YouTube, or SLC TV. Please continue to join us in whichever man manner you feel most comfortable. Right now we are in work session, which means there's no public comment, but please join us tonight during our 7 p.m. formal meeting to share your comments. And of course, we always welcome your feedback anytime by mail at P.O. Box 145476, Salt Lake City, Utah, 41114. Email at council.comments at slcgov.com or via our 24-hour phone comment line, 801-535-7654. This begins our work session, and our first agenda item is item number one, fiscal year 2023-2024 budget for unresolved issues follow-up. And we have Jen Bruno here to help walk us through this, and I think we have some motion sheets you have some paperwork at your places some motion sheets that we'll be going through just to make sure we're prepared for adoption later tonight at seven um, I did just want to uh, cover a few um, highlights I think we've spent a lot of time you guys <laughs> have spent a lot of time in the weeds and the very very detailed discussions on different items different elements in the budget and so um, as staff we thought it might be helpful to kind of zoom back out and um, have highlight some of the few kind of big takeaway big themes from this year's budget because I think it accomplishes uh, a lot of the goals that the council and the administration have um, established as priorities I think the major themes just from a money perspective were housing and homelessness from um, sort of all different angles um, overall you've increased funding for housing between the RDA and general fund and other funding sources by around 20 million dollars 17 million in the RDA and other uh, funds You've also expanded um, how we do housing in the city. So rather than just um, giving loans for housing development, you've established a citywide ADU incentives program, which you just talked about in the RDA um, uh, briefing, and then a program to provide loans for repairs for naturally occurring affordable housing. Those are kind of new tactics, that new tools that the city is adding to the toolbox for um, affordable housing, which is exciting. Um, it expands the city's response to homelessness and the community impacts of homelessness in a variety of ways and various departments in the city are all part of that. Um, increasing the community health access team in the fire department, um, increasing the civilian responders in the police department, adding a new RV compliance team along with funding for RV repairs for folks who would move along but um, have barriers to do that for whatever reason. Um, and then it increases the budget for cleaning around encampments uh, and in the public right of way. Um, the council also added funding for a new sanctioned camping catalytic grant program and um, and we'll be talking more about that as the summer goes on. Uh, the budget also demonstrates the city's value, the city valuing employees. Um, and the council took that discussion further by um, talking about pay parity among um, the legal defenders and prosecutors, um, recognizing that the legal defenders are an integral piece of the criminal justice system um, for residents who might not otherwise have access, and connecting clients to resources and services to help them um, in their recovery. Uh, while the city, while the budget does use um, the, the city's healthy savings account to balance, um, the council's ultimate deliberations do keep fund balance above the 13% goal established by policy and in the funding our future category well above that. Um, and uh, with the council's continued legislative intent, um, the council's continuing to uh, ensure efficient use of tax dollars and appropriate roles uh, for the city through continued evaluation of new and existing programs. Um, the budget expands city support for local businesses in a variety of ways, including increased funding for mitigating the effects of construction around the city and continued evaluation for the downtown street activation and funding for an SAA study in the Granary District. The council also um, uh, Prioritize road safety by increasing funding for quick install traffic calming measures and funding for railroad crossing feedback signs. The council also continued the priority of transit by um, enhancing the K-12 Hive Pass by adding parent guardians for the school district program. And then uh, the council increased the total amount to the capital improvement program budget by over 1.2 million. Uh, and those will be those funds will be discussed later in the summer. So that was just an effort to sort of take some of the, what has been uh, council priority in recent years and sort of highlight where the budget either furthers that priority or um, 
achieves that priority. And I, I'm, I'd be interested to know <laughs> if you guys have any additional things you'd want to highlight. And if not, I can go to the motion sheet. Thank you, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. We certainly have worked a lot, worked hard this year, and I think there's a lot that we are accomplishing. Councilmember Wharton, do I see a hand? Uh, yes. So if the, um, so if you can remind me all the way back to just yesterday, <laughs> um, when we straw polled the um, air quality, did we put all of that in the holding account, just the programs? Just the new program funding. Okay, and then the FTE were- Is funded. Is funded. So if we need to, if we decide to fund the programs later, that won't come out of general fund, it will come out of- The holding uh, account. Holding account. That is correct. Okay, and then um, I think that I wasn't able to be at the meeting about the, um, the funding parity for the DA and um, LDA, what, what did we straw poll for that? So the um, straw poll was to fully fund the request to uh, establish the city prosecutor at the same level, the city prosecutors at the same level as the attorney generals, and then adjust the LDA, funding for the LDA based on their request, which would also get them to that level. And we were able to do that because of the new tax numbers that came in between those meetings. Yes, I think that is accurate. Yes. Sorry, new tax numbers and recaptured CIP projects funding. Okay. And we also increased the amount going to CIP from the mayor's recommended budget. Yes. Okay. Yes to all of that. <laughs> With that, I will share my screen and we can start going through the motion sheet, which you have in front of you. It's an 11 by 17 paper with <laughs> Let's see. With, um, yes, it's a giant paper. Okay, so um, just to walk you through what each motion does, the motion number one adopts the library fund budget. And we um, have historically approved the library fund budget separately. Different councils at different times have wanted to vote on it separately, and that's why we do it. <laughs> the next budget, or the next motion, adopts the city budget. And within that city budget adoption ordinance, it references all of the contingent appropriations. So these appropriations, you don't need to read them um, out loud when you make your motion, you just need to read the red text. Um, these are all the contingencies that will be in that budget adoption ordinance. So the first one is a foothill trails contingency. The second one is a continued contingency. This is one we do each year for funding our future sales tax dollars. The third one is a contingency relating to the air quality incentives program that Council Member Wharton was just referencing. And the last one is a contingency relating to the sanction camping catalytic grant fund. So you don't need to read those aloud when you make your motion to approve it, but just know that approving that motion also approves those contingencies. Then motion number three sets all of the tax rates for the city. This is like probably the most important motion because it's literally the money. <laughs> so um, we do read off the decimal points, so apologies about that. Um, then the next motion approves the amount to be transferred into CIP, including the funding shown on this motion sheet so that all of the debt service payments that are proposed to be funded out of CIP can be funded as of July 1. So this means that um, you'll approve a lot of the project specific um, amounts later in the summer, so uh, in, you'll finalize them in August, um, but you'll be able to make your debt service payments as of July 1. Motion number five adopts the legislative intent statements um, so we finalized the wording on those statements yesterday, but let us know if you catch anything. Sometimes we miss things. Um, so there's a, several of those, won't read them all. And then motion number six adopts all of the other ordinances. I have a question, Jennifer. Yeah. Um, it said, the motion language says, for this is number five, um, a legislative intent as outlined in motion sheet uh, under motion five, items A through I, but the items are oh. numbered E through M. That's a great catch. We will adjust that. Thank you. Thanks. E? <laughs> Add in the I, I love it. Uh, no matter how many times we do this, we always catch something. <laughs> so, 
Motion number six is all other budget related ordinances. So um, this is uh, basically everything. Uh, all the other ordinances that are needed to implement the budget. The one additional one that is here is number J, item J, which is the resolution relating to compensation philosophy. That's the one, the resolution um, that you guys read yesterday during yesterday's meeting. So, And that also says A through K. Okay. Thank you. We'll correct that too. <laughs> Thank you. Okie doke. That's all I have. Any other? Uh, council members, any more questions on what we are doing tonight? I guess we'll get new pieces yes. of paper. Yes. Um, but the wording for those contingent appropriations legislation should be the same. So right. um, if we catch anything else, let's. Yeah, please let's, let us know. Let's all read through it real quick before, <laughs> before we do that. Um, I think that we are. Were there any other questions? No, I just wanted to uh, nice. Thank say you. if you go ahead, to Jen and Councilor the staff, I think this is one of the budgets that it's been easier to understand, easier to like, you know, see where the, the money is coming from, how we're going to do it, and I think there's been more uh, discussion perhaps. So and and a lot of information from you guys. So thank you so much, Ben, and everybody else that is listening to our staff. Um, if you guys don't know, and if we haven't said it enough, these guys work so hard. And uh, RDA chair said it earlier, people don't even know how much, how hard it is to run the city and the stuff that we have is amazing and makes us, uh, make us look good. So thank you. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Second to that. And I also want to say appreciated the budget presentations by the departments this year. They were consistent, easier, much, very easy to follow. So thank you for making those improvements for us. Very well, yeah, very good work. I was gonna say the same thing, just thank you for, uh, you know, less than a month ago, I was really panicked about um, some of the unresolved issues. And so thanks to um, all of the accounting people who figured out um, and non-accounting people who um, helped us find the money necessary. And thanks to um, city council staff for helping um, allocate that where all of our priorities are. Um, one priority that that I have put on the back burner or taken off the stove, I guess, for this budget season that, but that I really want to push for in the future, and it's one of the things that I talked about at the retreat, is uh, funding a more um, robust and expansive mural program. And so um, I think in light of the other issues that we needed to address this budget, I like I said, kind of took that off the stove, but I'm something that I'm going to be pushing for more um, going forward. So I hope that we can start having that conversation now because I, I think it's um, important to address. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I think we're going to take another break, right? So that we can stay on time with when we have told people to come or do we want to go to administrative updates first? Are those... I think we're waiting. Is it? They're not ready till three. The, you're, yeah, you guys are planning on three, right? Or is this who's? Are you ready to go now? Let's let's do let's get them done then. So we are going to move up to item number two on the agenda, which is informational updates from the administration. I see Tim Cosgrove and Andrew. And our new liaison, and I'm so sorry, I forgot your name already, Alicia. Good afternoon, Council. Thank you for having us here today. I just wanted to say uh, briefly how much I personally appreciate and respect all the work that you're doing on the budget. It's such a huge collaborative undertaking and your staff does an awesome, awesome, excellent job. Um, <clears throat> moving on to our uh, next slide, community engagement highlights. This is our regular, regularly updated highlights that we do out throughout the city, as you know. Outreach is so important. And uh, this is just a reminder for our residents where they can go and engage with the city, find 
the most recent surveys and, and updates from those surveys. And next slide, we have to that point, the thriving in place. It's our community driven process to analyze and understand gentrification and displacement and then craft a plan of action or an anti-displacement plan. And it is in the 45 day public comment period, which will end on June 26th. Uh, the project team has made several presentations as requested uh, to the recognized community organizations. And we'll also be at the Partners in the Park tonight, event tonight, uh, June 13th. Uh, Jordan Park. Uh, community members are encouraged to visit the plan website thrivinginplacesslc.org to review the plan, the overview, the two-year strategy, and to provide input up until June 26th. And then next slide, we have our community outreach team. This is real exciting for particularly Josh and I, who've <laughs> been covering the last couple months, and Hannah too. Um, so Zoe Stewart is our new digital community liaison. Uh, she's a part-time, and she'll be helping with answering and responding to folks trying to engage with the mayor's office in the city through digital means like social media and as we get her up to speed well we are hopeful that she'll be able to do some of the more proactive work in spreading information in the digital formats she will be closely working with the mayor's office communications team and our slc tv media and then to my left here very excited to have Alicia De Leon. Uh, she just started with us on Monday, and she'll be our new community liaison for the mayor's office. She replaces Ava Lopez. Um, we're still kind of finaling, finalizing the council districts. Our team will be covering. Uh, we're meeting on that tomorrow, and there will likely be some changes coming, but uh, we'll notify council office when we finalize that. And did you wanna? It's a pleasure to meet you all. It's an honor to be here and work with you all and learn as well. So thank you. Welcome. Welcome to the team. Pick me, pick me, <laughs> pick me. And then just our last slide is the June events. There's a, so much coming up. Um, we've already been around through our community office hours. There's one more left at uh, La Brazza coffee and don't forget the Sugar House Rocks concert series on June 16th and the Arts Festival coming up on June 23rd. I think that's that's it for me. Thank you Tim. Andrew you next. Uh, next slide please. We'll keep it short today uh, knowing your busy schedule. Uh, you can see the numbers uh, still very high. Uh, utilization rate of the resource centers uh, were 99 percent still. Um, this week, there's an encampment impact mitigation uh, occurring on Gladiola Street, uh, west of 215 in uh, District 2, I believe. And uh, a number of camps still. You can see the numbers there. Um, a lot of activity by the rapid inter intervention team. Uh, we had a resource fair on Friday at the 9th South River Park, and you can see some of the highlights about Justice Court was there and the Health Department. Some cases were resolved, some vaccinations. And then the Kayak Court continues to be maybe a single location court this, uh, so far this spring and summer um, due to the location of individuals and other factors. So they're still working on where that will be uh, this coming Friday, uh, but we'll let you know that as soon as possible. The only other updates are uh, the task group uh, focused on winter overflow for next winter. Uh, the task group of mayors in the county is meeting with other elected officials and representatives. They have uh, essentially divided into three parts. They are looking at uh, lands right now the cities have brought forth to look at land and buildings that are possibilities, as well as state-owned, county-owned facilities. Um, Wayne Ederhauser is deeply involved in that. They're also looking at the budget, and a lot of that's coming from the state, obviously, and they have some money right now set aside uh, from the Office of Homelessness Services towards that effort. 
And then the third piece is the actually operating of it. So finding an operator to run it and uh, protocols, we are still actively discussing the need for it to be 24 hours a day and seven days a week instead of just overnight. Uh, but we'll have more updates as we get closer to uh, or into July as closer to August 1st deadline. Mr. Chair. Yeah. I just want to point out uh, how far this group has gone over the last couple of years. I think uh, three years ago when we were kind of pushing the, the county to look at uh, winter overflow shelters, it was just chirping. And there was no one was kind of raising their hand. Uh, this last meeting we had last week, uh, there was, I think, four or five locations and cities that were, you know, really actively looking and actively participating in the discussions. And it would kind of was uh, uh, great to hear different areas that you weren't hearing from two years ago stepping up and, and really participating in the process. So hats off to the whole team on, on uh, making that transition. Thanks, council member. Uh, I, I will say that there's a lot of work to be done still in this space. And from the provider side, and they're participating in this process, they are still advocating actively for a year round option. So it's not a uh, set it up in the winter time and shut it down in April, uh, which we've seen for a number of years, which isn't helpful for most folks. Um, so that's still, still the undercurrent. Uh, but the reality for the state legislation and the funding available is it's winter, and we'll work on the bigger uh, process of being closer. Thank you, Andrew. All right. Is that everything from the mayor's office today? Thank you so much for all your work and for giving us these updates every week. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think now we should go to break. Is there anyone? I don't see. Well, Daniel's here, but I don't see Nick. Okay, yeah. I think we should go to break. It doesn't look like the we are here. So let's come back at, should we say 3 o'clock? That's 20 minutes. We're ahead of time, and people aren't in the room yet. So why don't we come back at 3? Thanks. Thank you for waiting. Oh, and we have Council do we have Councilmember Fowler with us online as well? Great. So we are on item number three, which is an item an informational update about the three hundred West Corridor and Station Area plan. Nick Tarbit is here from Council Staff to give us an introduction, and then I see Daniel Echeverria here and Nick Norse in the audience. Okay, uh, Taylor Scott, there's a presentation for this item if you'd pull it up. Um, this is a briefing on the 300 West Corridor and stationary plan which covers the blocks adjacent to 300 West from 1000 South to 2100 South. This is an early opportunity for planning division to get feedback from the council on the progress they're making, what their plans are going forward and to get any policy recommendations for you to consider throughout the process. Oh, I'm sorry, Albert, maybe that's a lot better. There you go. Okay, sorry about that. So this is just an opportunity for the council to provide some early input on the policy and the items that will be considered during the public process. So with that, I'll, Daniel will give a presentation on it. Great, thank you. So uh, again, we're in the very beginning stages uh, of this planning process. And again, this is for the 300 West Corridor and Central Point Station Area Plan. Uh, we just want to give you a brief overview of the process that we're looking at and then get any early input from the council. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll just start by going over the area that we're looking at. So the project area extends from uh, the I-15 on an off-ramp at about 1,000 south on the north end, extends down south to 2100 south, and then from uh, I-15 on the west, it extends to the tracks line or 200 west on the east, and then it has a carve-out uh, at 1700 south to 2100 south that extends up to West Temple. So there's two different areas of focus here. Uh, there's the extended area on the north end. Uh, the the uh, background on that is that the ballpark area plan already has some detailed policies that apply to that area. 
and it's been recently adopted, so we don't want to rehash that again. So the consultant on this project will be focusing on implementing the ballpark plan, uh, particularly through zoning and land use policies. Uh, on the focus area on the south end, uh, near 2100 South, because there's not a ballpark plan already in place, they're going to be doing a completely new plan with new policies, uh, and then again, uh, after that, imposing uh, some zoning. Next slide, please. So just for some background here, uh, this area has been on the minds of the Planning Commission and staff for a number of years. Uh, the residential development interest has been particularly high in this area uh, for the past few years, but there's been a realization that the zoning in place really does not align with city policies uh, related to housing, walkability, connectivity, street engagement. Uh, in particular, the zoning out here is general commercial, and the general commercial is really intended for commercial development, light industrial development. Uh, it's not, it was never really intended for the residential development that we're getting right now in this area. <clears throat> so as a result of this uh, plan, we want to ensure that we do have design standards in the zoning, uh, in, in our land use policies uh, that apply to future development in this area. Additionally, the 300 West Bikeway recently completed installation, and again, the general commercial zoning really has no policies or no regulations that require any sort of street engagement or encourage use of the bikeway. And then on top of that, the state recently uh, imposed a mandate for a station area plan for any cities that have a track station in their boundaries. Uh, we're required to develop a new station area plan for the area around that station, and in this case, we have the Central Point Station at 21st South uh, that requires a new plan. Next slide, please. So because of those reasons, uh, the city applied for a grant from Wasatch Front Regional Council uh, to hire a consultant to develop a new plan and develop new zoning for the area. Uh, we were awarded $140,000 with a $10,000 match from the city, so there's a total budget of $150,000 for this project. Uh, WFRC then facilitated a RFP process, and we selected Design Workshop as a consultant, and Design Workshop recently completed the Downtown Heights uh, zoning work that was recently adopted. Next slide, please. So as far as timelines go, uh, we are again just barely starting this process. Uh, we're in June now, so we are beginning some public outreach. Uh, the first part of that will involve direct interviews with business owners, uh, property owners, and residents. Uh, we'll also be sending out a mailer to all, prop to all properties, re resident residents, and business owners uh, so they can put their feedback on a, a website. In the meantime, uh, the consultant will be doing some site assessment, research, and developing an existing conditions report and analysis. Following that engagement and that existing conditions report, the consultant will develop two different alternatives, and they will then take those alternatives to a open house in August for public feedback. And then based on the public feedback we get, uh, they will take one of those scenarios forward as the draft plan. And then we'd anticipate bringing that draft plan to the council in fall or winter 2023. Then, if that plan is adopted, the consultant will then start work on the zoning uh, to actually uh, implement the plan. And we'd hope to bring that to the council in spring 2024. And I think that about covers it. Uh, again, we're early in the process, but happy to take any questions or any early feedback on that. Thanks, Daniel. Council members, Dugan? Yes, sure. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Daniel, for this uh, introduction on this, uh, the project schedule. When one of the policy questions just talks about the public engagement process, and you know, when we usually talk about these plans and we talk about that, the neighborhoods, there's a big neighborhood. Well, this doesn't have a big neighborhood. I mean, it has a, you know, Costco, Home Depot, and those are two owners of big property, so the the neighborhood really needs to be probably expanded and maybe it's more uh, not just that normal one mile radius or you know the community council because everyone goes down there to do certain things but they don't live in the area and I just I'm just curious about that whole public engagement process for this specific focus area and are you doing anything different than what you'd normally do in a an area that has a lot more uh, 
population. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're considering doing some social media outreach, um, some signs actually on the site that people that are just traveling into the area might see, uh, but recognize it, it is a little difficult to capture people that are just driving in and driving right out. Uh, we are considering also doing some outreach at the track station, so we are capturing people traveling in and out through the track station. Uh, we haven't finalized the complete strategy, but I think that's a good consideration. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Councilor uh, Daniel. I am wondering about the. Uh, let's see. You have in there that the consultant scope that they were hired for actually includes drafting the land use and zoning code changes. Is that new, or is that typical? Because if I remember, station, ballpark station area plan did, like staff is doing that themselves, right? Is this something that we plan to do more of in the future? Is having the consultant plan those land use code changes right on the tail of the small area plans? I don't know if we'll necessarily do it in every plan, but for this one I think it, it makes sense, especially because we have the ballpark plan policy that's already in place, and so we wanted the consultant to just kind of immediately look at zoning. I mean, I'm, could I'm supportive of it, to be clear. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, and this particular consultant that was selected is also the consultant who worked on the downtown building height stuff, so they're already familiar with the zone in question for the majority of the zone. So we felt it was, uh, there, there's less of a, um, I don't know the right term, but uh, they have a solid understanding of it. Good. <laughs> and so uh, we, we felt this was appropriate to put in for this. I scope. That makes sense. But it isn't something that we've done a lot of before, is it? I don't. We, we haven't, when in the, historically when we've done it, we've had some issues with those codes and we've ended up having to do a lot of work at the staff level to try to get things even to fit into our code structure. Um, but this particular consultant seems to have a good grasp of that. Great. So, Council members, any more questions about this? Uh, very excited about this project and, and excited for the changes that will be happening there. And I know that this one's a little tricky because you're coordinating with South Salt Lake as well, right? And is it the same consultant working with both municipalities? It is not. It's, it's a different, not. Okay, it's a different even more consultant. complicated. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, excited to see what what comes of that. Hopefully, we'll be able to coordinate with South Salt Lake and their consultant as well. Yep, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we just had a long break, so I think we're going to skip the Great. Can I, uh, did we s confirm that we have all the individuals lined up for the f next few items? I, th I think I see the um, next one. So, okay, we will move on to item number five. Brian Fulmer from council staff is going to give us an introduction. This is an ordinance for a rezone at approximately 510 South 200 West. Diana Martinez is the principal planner here, and I see John Anderson as well. Hello. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is a proposal to amend the zoning map for the approximately one acre parcel at 510 South 200 West from its current D2 or downtown support district to D1 or central business district, and it's located in council district four. No development plans were submitted with a petition, and the petitioner is in the audience, I believe, and available to answer questions if the council has them. And with that, I'll turn it over to Diana. Hello. I don't know that you need any more from me that you got didn't get from Brian. Will you go to the next one, the next slide? Yeah. There you go. Thank you. Um, just to reiterate, this property is just over an acre. It's located the southwest corner of 5th South and 2nd West. This area is kind of an expansion area from the downtown, so it's very logical to, to increase the, the height of the buildings to the D1. Um, as you're aware, that just went through you last week for the ordinance change. Um, the, uh, the by right size would be 200 feet height, excuse me, and then anything beyond 200 would have to have the design re, uh, design standards that go with that. Um, the Planning Commission did see this and voted unanimously, excuse me, to send you a favorable recommendation on this. So we are in support. 
any questions? And the applicant is here if you needed anything further. All right, Council Members, any questions before we see if the applicant would like to address the Council? Okay, typically we allow the applicant a few minutes if they're here. Would you like to come up? Looks like no. <laughs> you don't? Okay. Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> And if there are no more questions, Brian, can you help us through the timeline on this one? Yes, uh, you will set the date tonight for a, let me get this here. I believe it's a November, or a, sorry, July 11th public hearing and potential action on July 18th. All right. Sounds good, seeing no questions. I guess we are cruising right along. Thank you. All right. Nice and easy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, item number six. Do we? Okay. This is an ordinance about non-conforming signs. Do we have the people here that? Yes. Okay. Brian Fulmer again. Okay. And Nick Norris. All right. This is a proposal from the administration to amend the city ordinance related to non-conforming signs. These are signs which were permitted under city code when they were constructed, but under the current code, they do not conform to the standards. So the proposal would allow more flexibility in maintaining, reusing, modifying, and updating these existing signs. It would also align sign standards with federal and state statutes, city goals, and would help support businesses. And I'll turn it over to Nick. So I'm kind of flying by the seat of my pants here on this, but um, if we could go to the next slide on the presentation, I'm happy to go through it. Um, so generally a non-conforming sign is a sign that was legally existing at the time it was constructed, but over time it has changed. And um, I'm gonna let Kaylin take the presentation. Sign. Sorry, that first item took way a lot, lot less time than I thought. We're just going real <laughs> fast today. End of the budget. Yeah, you're ready to be out of here. All right. Um, so yeah, so non-conforming signs, I'm sure you're familiar, but just to sum up, they're just signs that were legally existing at the time they were constructed, but due to changes in the zoning ordinance or map amendments, they are no longer conforming to the current standards. Um, there are types of non-conforming signs that are not impacted by this text amendment. Those are vintage signs and billboards. Those are both regulated separately by their own individual ordinances, and they will not be impacted by this text amendment. Next slide. Next slide. <laughs> So the current code is very restrictive. Um, basically, no alterations are permitted whatsoever, including changing the sign face to a different business's sign. Um, for example, like this one right here, the car wash, they changed business ownerships and required changing the sign. We had to do some mental gymnastics to get around the ordinance for this. <laughs> Because there is federal law that states that we cannot regulate sign content, and so this is problematic in our code. So we needed to make sure we addressed that. There's also um, language in there that prevents any kind of relocating the sign, making the sign smaller, uh, replacing it, altering it in any way um, is prohibited unless the whole thing is brought into compliance with current zoning standards. There is a state law that indicates that non-conforming uses and non-complying structures are required, we are required to allow their reuse. And under this current zoning ordinance, um, it's very preventative of allowing people to reuse those signs. So we needed to update that to comply with state law. Next slide. So the proposed code is relatively simple. Um, modifications are permitted so long as those modifications do not increase the level of nonconformity. Um, this includes changes to location, dimensional standards like sign face size or height, um, and the replacement of any part of the sign structure. Uh, it also clarifies that sign maintenance is permitted, so people who own nonconforming signs can do maintenance to keep them looking nice. Um, it also clarifies and adds language that identifies when a uh, non-conforming sign is considered abandoned and requires the removal of that sign, um, usually within one year of it being discontinued. Next slide. 
So during the public engagement process, we received some comments with concerns about the city standards or lack thereof addressing electronic signs. Currently, the only area, the only portion of the sign ordinance that addresses electronic signs is the billboard ordinance, and so those only are related to billboards. Uh, there is language in the code that does prohibit animated signs, but as long as the sign is fully legible within three seconds, it's not considered animated under the current code. Um, there was a text amendment addressing electronic sign standards broadly that was um, process proposed in 2012, but the city council at that time decided not to take it up. Um, that included language and definitions related to dwell times and twirl times, how big an animated or an electronic sign can be, that kind of thing. Next slide. Um, the Planning Commission heard this on the March 29 uh, agenda and considered the request and voted unanimously to send a positive recommendation to the City Council. And that is it. Thank you. Council members, any questions on this item? Dugan? Yes, uh, thank you very much. On, back on the, uh, uh, the dwell time and the lights, is there anything on uh, the brightness and dimming them and, and hours? Because I know that we have that, we've had that discussion on billboards, and, uh, but how does it uh, impact this, or does this impact the lights? or state anything about lights? This doesn't address anything directly with lighting. It only um, addresses non-conforming signs. That was my, my follow-up question. So you, this slide that you had, I think just previous to this, mm -hmm. is not included in this ordinance. It that is, is not Those included. are changes that had been drafted that a previous council chose not to consider? Correct. So they were just never acted on. Just never so acted on. It was a part of a broader changes to the sign code that at the time created some, I don't know the right term, but uh, but there definitely were some potential issues with, so, with, those, with how broad those changes were. And so that petition just wasn't acted on. Um, I think one of the things and why we didn't include it in this is because this was really focused on just the non-conforming signs and we think those regulations should apply to all signs. And so we, we didn't advertise that change as part of this proposal. Um, so was this like a foreshadowing of something that we should do in the future? Is that, is, does this still seem Let's important? Say yes. Okay. Because <laughs> so it, it, it seems like something that should, we should have an ordinance about. Yeah. Yes, it is. Okay. And, and those, those things apply to, to billboards and they should apply as sign technology has changed dramatically, especially over the last five or six years. Right. Um, those Absolutely. things really need to be thought so, of. And Mr. Chair. Is this something that in our adoption of the non-conforming signs, we could do a legislative intent to say we would like to pick this back up or is this now outdated from 2012? You'd have to start over. I think we'd want to look at it, but it, it basically applied the federal guidelines for dwell and twirl times um, that apply to billboards. And I think it had something about the brightness. So like electronic billboards, like at night, they have to or change their brightness, brightness. Yeah. level. Yeah. And But those don't apply right now to on-site signs. Got it. And so it would, it, it would be, I mean, I, I think it's a simple text amendment. That doesn't mean it won't be controversial, but it should be, you know, it should be taking those same parameters and just applying them to any electronic sign. Mr. Mr. Chair? Yeah, Councilman Pruitt. I uh, went uh, way out of my way to visit uh, the Mill Creek Commons, um, oh a scary God. place way, way uh, outside Salt Lake City. Uh, but no, uh, and uh, there is a, a beautiful billboard uh, outside the City Hall uh, that, uh, that they're building in Mill Creek. And the billboard that they have in there has this new technology. Uh, if you are uh, in the sidewalk, you cannot really see it on, um, but it, you know it is pointing to where you know the, they wanted to show it, uh, and it it also dims down uh, at night. Uh, it's using the newest technology there is for birds. Um, uh, and for humans uh, to not encroach on property. So I was very 
impressive to see this technology being used here in this valley. Uh, and I love Mill Creek, by the way. So just <laughs> clear, clear that Mill out. Creek. To be clear, billboards, w even if we were to take up, this would not be part of that. That's a co whole different section of the code, right? That's this correct. is on-site signage that we're yep. discussing. And I, I just wanted to okay. throw there on the conversation of technology on signs. Uh, okay. that, you know, some people will say, you know, they're too bright, but this technology exists now on these signs uh, to improve them and to make them better. And to, just to clarify my uh, question about the lights, so the, the lights would be really on the uh, on-premise signs ordinance, not this ordinance, which is the um, non-conforming. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If we added them to this, they'd only, it would only apply to then it would only apply to the non-conforming signs. We want them to apply and to all signs. Could you tell me what a vintage sign is? So a vintage sign is a sign that, because of when it was uh, established and, and built, it that has some sort of unique characteristics that help contribute to the character of a neighborhood. And so one of the most readily available examples of that is on the Salt Lake Costume Company building. Um, that's a vintage, I mean, we found a way to do that without a vintage sign, but we used to have a, a code prov provision that basically required all those signs to be um, replaced as properties were redeveloped. The vintage sign regulation provides incentives to keep those signs without negatively like impacting your ability to have modern signs too. Um, so it's just a way to try to Interesting. allow those signs to be kept. So Co Coachman sign? Could potentially could be, be. be that, yeah. Yeah, there's a process to declare it. So if, if the property owner wants it, it's not a requirement that they do it, but if a property owner wants to say, hey, I wanna keep this sign, um, we determine that administratively that it's a vintage sign and then they get to keep it they can relocate it on their property they can even relocate it in the same district if they want um, but it doesn't they also get all the other sign allowances allowed under the zoning code oh that's interesting yeah good question councilman Jigan. mr chair so i i'm in support of what you said earlier that if we had to put in a legis legislative intent that we look into the electronic signs after this, it would be nice. I mean, 2012, what is it? 20, what is it? 10, 11 years That's now? 11 yeah, years of, ago. Yeah, yeah, technology changes rapidly, especially these days. We ought to be up well, to that date. That sounds like we didn't adopt anything in 2012, so we're not even up to date in 2012. Right, right, so. right, exactly. So we probably should look into it. We should probably do that. Yep, thanks. Wharton. So it sounds like this is mostly just adding about the um the applicability parts um it doesn't this doesn't seem like it's a major departure from the language above or from the existing ordinance so what it, it gives more flexibility for people to keep signs that don't comply when the use is changing or when they want to make modifications and we've had several instances over the years where somebody has had to invest i mean signs are really expensive and so it uh, we, we've had a number of small businesses who, whether right or wrong, they would go out and invest in these signs to replace it on a pole or something, and that sign's not allowed anymore, and they can't do it. And so this basically is making it um, easier for small businesses to utilize existing signage and create some updates to those signs to be more efficient with lighting, um, how they change things out, things like that. Yeah, I mean, and I don't want to like over, it probably doesn't matter, but because my reading of the current one is that it allows for you to modify and maintain a non-consisting sign as long as it's put back in the same location and manner, and that seems to be substantially similar to what the new ordinance does. If you go back in the presentation, I have the language of the existing one more yeah so the first sentence is the big part the non-conforming sign shall not be reconstructed raised moved replaced extended altered or enlarged unless the sign is changed so as to conform to all provisions of this chapter so that means if the sign is non-conforming because it's too big and they want to move it to a different spot they can't unless they make it smaller 
Oh. Not even if they make it smaller, they make it completely they compliant have to make with the code. The entire thing, yeah. Okay. Compliant. But the new ordinance says that you can change it mm -hmm. as long as it's not more non-complying than it its current state. That's correct. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Any more questions, council members? Sounds great. What's the timing on this one, Brian? It's the same as the, the other June. one, setting the date. July uh, 11th. July 11th okay. tonight, and then potential action on the 18th of July. Wonderful. Thank you. Do we have the presenter, presenters on item number seven, Riverside Cottages, with us? Looks like we do. Okay, let's just keep going along. Number seven, zoning map and master plan amendments at Riverside Cottages. Yes. Okay, thank you. This is a proposal to amend the zoning map and Northwest Community Master Plan future land use map for the properties at 1500, 1516, 1522 West, 500 North, and 552 North, 1500 West. Current zoning is R1-7000 or single family residential and the proposed zoning is R1-5000 and SR3, and SR3 is special pattern residential. The petitioner stated they intend to conduct, construct single family detached homes. He is here with us and would like to address the council about his proposal. And with that, I'll turn it over to Aaron. Thank you, Brian. Uh, so next slide. There will be a map because that was a lot of addresses um, that will help illustrate what's going on here. Even here, we'll try and break it down. So there are basically two separate requests happening here. The first is a, a zoning map amendment and master plan amendment for a section of these properties to be rezoned to SR3, and that requires the the master plan amendment to will the master plan to keep the rezone in um, in line with uh, the adopted plan of that neighborhood, the the master plan amendment is also necessary. Um, and then the other section of this rezone is the south section facing 500 north where the properties would, existing houses would be rezoned to R1-5000 in order to accommodate a little bit more space in the area behind them. So uh, next slide, here's the map on the, on the next slide. So the blue section here um, is the area that would be is requesting to be rezoned to SR3, um, including that master plan amendment. Uh, then the green is the section that would be rezoned to R15000. And you'll notice that the rezone doesn't quite line up with property lines, but that a uh, request, there's a plan development request also coming through, and I am processing that at the moment that would, as well as a subdivision application that is meant to align the uh, rezone, align the, the properties with the rezone. Uh, so uh, next slide. All right, so just conditions. The houses along 500 North are not going to change. Uh, we'll just slide through these really quick. These are the homes facing 500 North. Next slide. Next slide. Next. Next slide. And this is 552, 552 uh, North, 1500 West. This is the property that will see the most change, the area that's kind of at the back. It's accessed from 15th West onto uh, 600 North, 6 slash 700 North there by, the, by Bachman Elementary. Uh, so this is the area that will see most of the change. Along 500 North, where many citizens have had concerns and complaints, the character of that is not changing uh, with this rezone. Uh, next slide. So what does change with this SR3? Uh, smaller lots are permitted, um, up to 2,000 square feet for single family detached homes, but single family attached homes are also permitted. Uh, different housing types, there are more options, including townhomes and uh, two family duplexes. And then the setbacks are a little tighter than in the R1-7000. Next slide. So this was one of the more challenging Parts of it was um, trying to uh, 
keep the master plans in line with one another. So the SR3 district really is an effective compromise between Plan Salt Lake and Growing SLC, which promote that medium density infill, and the uh, Northwest Community Master Plan's um, request to kind of limit non-single family development within the community. Uh, so SR3 promotes that infill without significantly changing what was established in that community master plan in 1992. Next slide. Uh, just a note on neighborhood character, you can see many of the lots on this block are very deep and there is some dense infill um, in proximity of the subject property. There's a set of um, twin homes and duplexes uh, immediately north of the subject property and then to the west, also in yellow, there is a planned development that was approved many years past with multiple homes accessed onto a single private street. All right, next slide. So the Planning Commission met and con considered this item on September 28, 2022, and they voted unanimously to forward a positive recommendation. Between then and now, there were a number of things that uh, planning staff had to coordinate with the applicant to get it to a, a place that it was presentable to you today. Next slide. Uh, there was some public feedback, specifically a neighborhood initiated petition that was included with the transmittal and they spoke at the planning commission hearing and were, had concerns about, especially about traffic on 500 North. Uh, next slide. And as I mentioned before, there is a planned development petition. This site really cannot be developed to the potential the applicant would like without planned development. You can see there the 50 foot right of way width, the lot width there requires uh, planned development in order to be developed and then also to establish that new property line on the south side. And with that, you know, in a planned development, there are additional standards that need to be met as far as traffic and impact on the neighborhood. So that you know, the planning commission will review that. This is only the, the first step in the process. Next slide. All right, thanks. Uh, the applicant is here and I have some plans available for him to refer, if you refer to. So Bert, if you're here, come on up to the empty seat. All right, we typically allow the applicant, is it five minutes? To address the council with anything you'd like to add to what staff has said. Thank you, council. Hello. <laughs> and uh, thank you, Aaron. Um, yeah. Uh, just to reiterate, mostly, <laughs> uh, the intended rezone. Um, can you is, be real oh, close sorry. to the microphone? They're, it, they're not voice, very sensitive. Sometimes my voice booms, and I try to avoid that. <laughs> <laughs> um, the intended rezone allows more flexibility in housing options through development of the inner block while maintaining the R15000 along the 500 north. Our intended homeowners are diverse, middle income, oftentimes dual income families, and intended to be owner occupied. Our proposal contains only single family homes with multiple floor plans to meet the needs of our diverse population, including multi-generational families. We have noticed a very strong demand for single family housing in the area and potential customers are attracted by Bachman Elementary, a regional park, shopping, banking, the Jordan River Trail system, and a location five minutes from the Salt Lake International Airport, two minutes from employment hubs such as L3, the state of Utah, and much more. The proposed development is consistent with the purpose statement of the SR3, as Aaron just explained, and uh, with the variety of housing types and scale and character of the development located with the interior portion of the city blocks. So all of the new homes will be on the inside of the city blocks and will be um, uh, renovating the homes on the, along the 5th North. Um, the housing options are consistent with the citywide plan, Plan Salt Lake including the goal to increase the number of medium density housing types and options. That's all I would have to say if there's any questions. Any questions, council members? Council member Petro. Um, the intention for the SR3 would be access from the 600 North and 1500 West. Is Correct. that Correct. So the, it's reasonable to expect that the 500 North traffic is relatively unchanged by this sort of development? Uh, well, actually, we have a, a pedestrian walkway from That was my next North question. Where is the, the walkway the for, to Backman? Is, does it go through the middle of this? Yeah, if, 
Uh, if you could pull up the plans, um, it should be this slide immediately after. And that's the a one. that's an easement that won't change throughout the development pattern. We can ask them to, and they've provided it, but I don't know that there's a requirement to make it an easement. But obviously, we. I I would really lo that school is highly accessed by people on foot, so any limitation to accessing it through patterns would be a real issue for me, I think. Well, it, at the site at the time, there is no access through the middle of the block. There's an easement, but there's a gate on it, and it's, it's, uh, it's not. So the walkway that currently exists between 500 North and Backman does not touch this property? It wasn't lined out. Okay, that's yeah, separate the, the from the current this. one is not at all okay, associated that, that was my question. Sorry. What we're really doing is adding um, uh, pedestrian okay, walkway through fine. the middle of the block, which I think might actually reduce the traffic problems a little bit at Bachman okay, because people are going all the way around. There's, it's, it's next to that. It's not a street. It's, it's just a walk. I think it's behind those houses right there. It's a walk. Yeah. See that paved spot with, with a crosswalk. I couldn't conceptualize if it was on this property or next It'll to it. It'll be the last page of the presentation. Yeah. I see. So, okay. So the, I just didn't want that effect. There's an existing walkway that will not be affected, but you're proposing an additional walkway that would allow students to get Increased. to Bachman. Yes. Okay. And I mean, then the, the whole attraction for these people is the idea that they're right next to the school and don't have to drive to drive their kids to school. Fifth North, they can walk easily now. And that, that proposed walkway would go from all the way to fifth North. Oh, that's great. Um, are you saying, so is, is that proposed? That's just in the proposed plan. That's not part of a development agreement or anything like that. Um, but it is part of the proposal. It looks like you already have a plan development application. And so if approved by the planning commission, that becomes required. Or does it not? How does that work? With uh, they are providing it as one of the uh, objectives within the for a plan development approval. So you have to provide certain so they got to provide that and it. it it will need to stay, and we can make sure that that happens. Okay, but it's not currently proposed as a condition of the rezone. Correct. Um, I mean, and then my understanding is, my, I'm guessing that the R15000 is just so that those existing homes, that the footprint of the lot can be reduced to allow more land to be developed on the SR3 it's, lots. It's, it's very, very rare that these extremely deep lots or actually utilize the last part of them. Is, yeah, preaching is never I totally get it. <laughs> um, so the four on there, is there any kind of proposed agreement to retain those existing four homes? I, I don't know what they look like or what the condition is, but. They're your typical west side. English. Not any agreement, but there would be, you know, housing loss mitigation requirements if they were to be demoed or they need to be replaced. Got it. On the properties they, are they currently rentals or are they being purchased they're currently rentals and is the plan to you said you the plan is to just fix them up but keep the yes structures? We've, already, we've already renovated one of them and the other ones are, are currently in under planning council members any more questions just i'm assuming other priorities like trees in the planned community and things like that are already being considered and amenable Yes, that's in our uh, plan development application. And were these for uh, either or both rent and or home ownership? Sorry? Oh, were the houses to be sold or rented out in the planning community? Uh, uh, sold. Okay. And we're, we, we placed a priority on owner-occupied, diverse, middle income. Okay. Owner-occupied. Thank you. That's perfect. So, you, so we're, there'll be family-sized housing as well? Sorry? It'll be family-sized housing as well? Single-family housing. Uh, how many bedrooms do you plan? That's very, very well. There's okay. a lot of multi-generational families on the west side. Yes. People want to take care of grandma. And then sometimes it's good to have an up-down kind of arrangement or we extra get a lot bedroom of people telling or us, extra entrance or something. Yeah, we get a lot of people telling us two-bedroom is family size on the west side, and it's really not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, council members, any more questions on this? Brian, are we on the same schedule for this as well? All right, we've got a lot of things coming up. Thank you for Thank you very much. getting all those teed up. Thank you for being here. Um, we are on to our last work session item, which is a zoning map amendment at 1549 South 
1551 South and 1565 South, 1000 West. Brian is here again, and Caitlin Harris. Amy Thompson. And Amy Thompson. Okay, this is a proposal to amend the zoning for those properties you mentioned in addition to 1574 South, 900 West from their current R17000 or single family residential zoning to RMF30, low density multifamily residential. The petitioner's objective is to construct row houses on the properties. I believe he, they are in the audience and available to answer questions the council may have. And turn it over to Caitlin. All right, so this is for the rezone of the four properties listed. Uh, next slide. So to give you a better idea of where these are located, they're, um, they connect in between 1,000 west and 900 west, um, just north of 1,700 south. Um, next slide. Um, this gives you an idea of what the zoning is in the area. Uh, just south is the CB zone, and there's also been some redevelopment in that area for multifamily housing as well. Um, there's an R2 and RMF35 zone nearby. Um, the strip of land on 1000 West that would remain R1-7000 has a I believe two single family homes on it, but also a number of duplexes in that zone. So they're non-conforming to the zone that is in place currently. Uh, next slide. As Brian mentioned, the request is to rezone from R17000, which is a single family residential zone, to RMF30, uh, which is a low density multifamily zone. The standards for the two are actually quite similar, except for the number of units that are permitted per lot. Uh, the maximum height for the R17000 is 28 feet, while RMF30 is 30. Uh, the maximum lot width for RMF30 is 110 feet, so they're not going to have be able to create mega lots. Um, the setbacks are also quite similar. The block face average uh, corner side yards are 10 feet. Um, interior side yard setbacks are 6 feet. Uh, and the rear yard maximum setback is 25 feet. They also are required to have two off-street parking stalls per dwelling unit. Um, and that is similar as in the single-family residential zone. Uh, the main difference, again, is the number of units that are permitted. In row house development in the RMF30 zone, they are permitted. Each building is required to have at least three units, but no more than six units per building. So you don't, don't get these super long mega buildings that block access. And, um, and so they would be able to provide as many units as would fit on the parcel within those con confines of the setbacks and number of units per building form. Next slide. Um, the Planning Commission heard this on the March 8th agenda and determined that the RMF 30 zone uh, implements key policies and goals outlined in the West Side Master Plan, which identifies vacant and underutilized parcels in this area as preferred locations for multifamily infill development, and was voted 9 to 1 to forward a positive recommendation to the City Council. And that's the end of that. Council members, any questions for staff? Does the applicant want to address the Council? No? You can answer questions if okay. you have any, but... Any questions for the applicant? Uh, I Councilman Pui. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, the only question is, uh, it relates to um, are there going to be, uh, and the questions that we always ask here, are they going to be for rent or for sale on the size of the, the units? Uh, I mean, those are the always, always the questions that we care a lot about. And while you're coming up, I... Also, is this is there a proposal for existing structures to be demolished, or is it just infill on the currently disused part there of the There are two existing single-family houses that would be demolished as part of this, and they did have to go through housing loss mitigation for that. Um, my name is Jordan Eck, and I'm the applicant. Um, it, we are in, intending on doing 28 four-bedroom, two-and-a-half-bath, um, four-cell units. Um, the lot shape is a little odd 
but this is really a phase two project to the 70 units that we're doing directly um, to the south, which is also slated to be for sale. Thank you. Any other questions, council members? So the the property that's currently zoned looks like commercial business, or is that yeah. right? Commercial yeah. business. Community business. Community business. I knew it was, I knew that I had to see <laughs> wrong. Uh, is, a, is your project as well, and you're saying that is 70 units of townhouses? Yeah. Also, okay, and so it'll be similar, similar scale, or is it a different? Um, almost identical. We just had to do it in two phases because these other outlier parcels were zoned um, R17. Okay, uh, so that really thin slice of the RMF30 that hits 900 west will be usable because you're, I'm assuming, sharing a driveway with something to the south? Um, yeah, it was. it's likely going to end up as fire access. Oh, okay. Because um, it's, you know, they're the fire apparatus are fairly large, so getting it out was easier just to take it out to 9th West rather than trying to do a hammerhead. All right. All right. I don't see any other questions. Appreciate that. Thank you. Same schedule on this one. Keeping it consistent. Thank you, Brian, for all of your work on those. We are moving on to our standing items. Um, Sharon by Share Report, I just want to say thank you to everyone for bearing with us through this budget process, staff and council members and everybody for all of your hard work and especially the mayor's staff and administration. Um, Vice Chair, any reports? Okay. We do have a report from the executive director. Just one announcement and that is um, the redevelopment agency has um, organized a fact-finding trip um, and it will be to Pittsburgh. It will be Wednesday, August 23rd through Sunday, August 27th. And you should have received this in your email. But just to give some background for the public record, um, the redevelopment agency previously, uh, several years ago, did uh, organize some uh, fact-finding missions to various cities. And the council members, mayor, and some of the um, professional uh, staff from the city departments and also the planning commission attended and came back with uh, several ideas that were uh, implemented successfully in the city. So uh, this is a continuation of that that has been on hold for several years. The, um, they'll, you'll be meeting, those of you who attend, meeting with Pittsburgh Redevelopment Authority to understand their real, real estate related operations. Um, and learning uh, the timeline and history of an area that had that was redlined and had a lot of eminent domain utilization uh, displacement from a sports arena and then redevelopment after the departure of a sports team and then uh, they also there have several uh, task force partnerships that have uh, been very successful. So we need to let the redevelopment agency know soon, um, hopefully by the end of this week, if you are available to attend. And it is quite a ways away, so um, give us your best guess as to whether you'll be here and then if something happens in terms of scheduling uh, on your end, uh, let us know as soon as it changes so that we can get uh, anything we've tentatively reserved, get that um, canceled. So let us know Friday preliminarily and then ASAP after that for sure. Great. Thank Thanks. you, Cindy. Council members, any questions? All right. We have a long break, but we cannot start early and staff needs time to prepare all the paperwork for the budget. So we will be back at 7 p.m. Hey, Councilmember Wharton is conducting. All right, we'll see you in a while.